fishing is actually uh, getting to take them home and actually eat them too. But uh, it's always a special occasion when you can catch that one that you consider a trophy and some sort of reward for you. Trophy is, in my eyes, a personal thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be the biggest fish. I think a trophy is something that you really enjoy. I'll give you an example. I caught a fish one time that only weighed about 10 pounds. For some people, that would be a great trophy, and it was. But the neat thing about that particular trout, it took me almost three hours to land it. So to me, that's probably the most ultimate trophy that, that I've ever caught, even though I've caught much bigger fish, caught more fish. And whether I take them home and eat them, doesn't, doesn't diminish the, uh, the reward of having the opportunity to go and be here and actually know that I was able to catch one of God's creatures and take it home for my nourishment or release it back into the wild and let it grow as they say, let it grow and get bigger so I can catch it the next time. I don't know about you, but I'm going to miss that uh, music. You know, I'm going to have to go watch some TV land and go back and watch the old episodes. I, uh, I hope that you've enjoyed the little video clips that we have before the sermons each week. What we've tried to do this summer is take some time to look at the fishing stories from the Gospels and, and look at the fish tales. And you may have noticed each week as you watch the little video clips that what the guys were talking about was not just fishing, but lessons in life. And the reality is this, that... That you may, I don't know if you picked up on something that Mike said in the, today's video, is that for him, the trophy fish wasn't necessarily the biggest one he'd ever caught, but it was one that took him three hours to catch that he caught on a little two pound test line with a small little fly. And uh, to take three hours there and doing the fly fishing and to be patient and take that time. And, and I hope you've noticed that during the series that they're not just talking about fish. What they're really talking about are people and relationships. And here's my hope as we conclude this series today. Every one of us, if we think back over the course of our lives, every one of us is here today in part, in large part, because of the influence of someone else in our life. There was a parent or a grandparent or a friend or a neighbor, a fellow student. Somebody invited us into relationship with Jesus Christ. Someone introduced us to what God is doing in the world. Someone invited us to church. Someone uh, taught us how to read the Bible. Someone told us stories and prayed with us before we went to bed every night. There is someone in each of our lives who's had a profound impact on our spiritual life. And so as we've walked through this series, the key word discipleship and what we're all about is that disciples follow and emulate what Jesus does. And what Jesus did, and we've read it in every story, is Jesus was always inviting others into some sort of relationship with God. Inviting them to follow him, inviting them into a new life, inviting them to a life of transformation, inviting them for a career path, a, a change in careers. Whatever it was, Jesus was always inviting. And I say this to our church members all the time, that we are in the introduction invitation business. I and mean, that's our job. God does all the transforming work. Our job is just to introduce people to Jesus so that Jesus can come into their lives and begin that work. The scripture that we're going to read today comes from the Gospel of John. And so if you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn to the Gospel of John. And as you're turning in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, I, I want to make a statement real quick. When I say pull out your Bibles, what I'm essentially assuming something, that you have your Bibles with you. I don't know if you know this, Methodists used to bring their Bibles to church. Now it seems it's only the Baptists that do that. All right, but... but Let's bring our Bibles, and I want you to know something, that it's okay to write in your Bibles. Now, I had a child at the early service grab the Bible. There's pew Bibles down in the seats in front of you. Uh, one of the little kids at the early service pulled out a pew Bible and started writing in it, and his father had to grab the Bible from him and said, uh, he said the little kid said, but Pastor Corey said I could write in the Bible. Um, I told him that is fine. They, if the kids want to write in the pew Bible and they take note, if they're paying that much attention to the preacher, amen, right? 
Uh, we'll have a few Bibles that will have some words in them. But I want to remind you to bring your Bibles. And the reason I want you to do that is because you may have notes. You may have something you want to remember. And I promise you, I have it on good authority. It's okay to scribble in your, in your Bible. It's okay to have a highlighter. So I would encourage you to do that. Hopefully you found the Scripture now. If I were to ask all of you to name in your, in your memory bank the most famous time that Jesus gathered for a meal with his disciples, what would you name? Last Supper, right? What are some other times? Just shout them out if you, if you think of them. What are some other times Jesus had a meal with the disciples? You remember? The loaves and the fish, the story we read last week, right? The feeding of the 5,000. Uh, other times that Jesus had meals. Remember, walk to Emmaus, Jesus sat down after he'd been walking along the road and ate a meal with the disciples. Well, today we're going to read um, what, is, what is arguably, what it is, is the last meal that Jesus ever had with the disciples here on this earth. And instead of it being called the Last Supper, we call this the Last Breakfast. And this is an important story to know and an important meal uh, to hear about because Jesus is very clear about some things with the disciples and there's some powerful things that happen um, that we need to understand and unpack this morning uh, if we're to understand uh, what God is calling us uh, to do and what God wants us to be about in our lives. And so hopefully you found John 21, beginning with verse 1. I invite you to hear the Word of God. Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, some translations say Tiberias, some say Galilee. You'll see the, the version there is the Galilee, but we're talking about the same body of water. Now, this is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. Then they said, we'll go with you. They set out in a boat, but throughout the night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Jesus called to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. He said, then cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they did. And there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the net. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it, that it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself for he was naked and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. For they weren't far from the shore, only about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet the net hadn't torn, even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast with me. None of the disciples could bring themselves to ask him, Who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. I want you to leave your Bibles open to this passage for just a moment. But before we talk too much about this particular scripture, it's important to know something. Um, Jesus didn't just appear out of thin air on the shoreline. Um, we're not sure exactly how long the disciples had been there and how long they had been fishing, uh, but we know that Jesus had given them some instructions prior to this story that we read today. And so if, if you want to really understand what John is trying to tell us in the 21st chapter of his gospel, then you ought to write a little note in your Bible that says, before I read John 21, go back and read Matthew 28, right? That'd be a little note you could write there to yourself because you don't really fully understand John 21 unless you also understand Matthew 28 and vice versa. You don't understand Matthew 28 unless you understand what plays out in this narrative. And so if you've still got your Bibles open, turn back just a few pages to Matthew 28, beginning with verse 16. Now, this one's probably more familiar to you. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. What we have here in Matthew 28 is what Christian historians and scholars refer to as the Great Commission. This is kind of Christianity 101 here for just a moment. If you don't know the mandate of any other scripture in the Bible, you need to understand and know and take to heart Matthew 28 because it is our mission statement. It is what we're called to do. In fact, the mission statement of Argyle United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, taken directly from Matthew 28. Our job is to make disciples. Now, we gather for worship. We have youth programs, children's programs. Uh, we have outreach ministries. Our students have been on mission trip. Carla's in the middle of planning a women's trip, by the way, to South America. If you, any women in the church would be interested in coming, it's Jamaica. It's not South America, so it's Jamaica. So you'll be a really fast runner if you go uh, with Carla to Jamaica. Uh, women only for this trip. But um, to... To get back to the point, is our job, wherever it is, is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. One of the things, hopefully, you noticed over the course of this series is that every week there was an invitation, wasn't there? Every week there was an opportunity for you to take the story, take what you had learned, and share it with someone else. You guys may remember... When we read this story this morning, it sounds familiar to a story we read in week one. Do you remember another great catch? That when Jesus called the disciples, he was down there on the sea. They'd been fishing all night. They hadn't caught anything, right? Just like they hadn't caught anything here. But the difference in that story is they caught so many fish. What happened to the nets in the first story? They tore. They broke. And then Jesus, after calling them to the shore, what did he say to them? After they just had the biggest catch of their lives, Jesus said this to them. He said, now I'm going to invite you to go off in a diff different career path. You've always been fisher, fishermen these, all these years. You've caught fish. That's been your job. Now I'm going to give you a new job. Your job now from this point forward is not to catch fish. Your job now is to catch people. And in that first week of this series, we were all invited into considering that perhaps God's biggest vocational call on our lives, whatever it was, whether we were doctor, lawyer, teacher, counselor, firefighter, whatever it was we do, whatever it is we do, that we have a greater vocation as Christian, as followers of Jesus Christ, as disciples, we have a greater vocation to bring others into relationship with Jesus Christ. That's our role. That's our job. That's what we're called to do. That's our mission. Now here we have a final tale in which Jesus is part of another miraculous catch. And as the disciples come to the shore, Jesus invites them into having breakfast. But, but what we need to understand when we read this story is that the disciples hadn't really followed Jesus' instructions. Because if you go back to Matthew 28... It says that the disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So where was it that Jesus asked them to be? On the mountain or in the sea? On the mountain. But we find in this story in verse 3 that Peter, and it seems to always be Peter. Isn't it always Peter in these stories? If I had been living at that time, it had always been me that Jesus would have said, now here's what you don't do, right? Here's the guy you don't want to follow, all right? So Peter says, you know what? I know what Jesus asked us to do, but I'm tired of waiting around. I'm not sure how this thing's going to end in the, in the end anyway, how it's going to end up. And so I'm going fishing. And what do the others do? They just follow right along with him. Now, you would have thought somebody would have said, now, Peter, hey, that's great, uh, but that's not what Jesus asked us to do. Jesus asked us to go to the mountain and wait. So we can wait and fish another time. Scholars have now taken this and really run with this and said, this isn't just Peter saying, I want to go fishing and I want to kill some time while we're waiting for Jesus. Uh, most scholars think that there's something much deeper and more significant that's happening when Jesus 
finds the disciples out there fishing. When Peter says, hey, I'm going fishing, and the other ones say, I'm going to go with you. What scholars believe is this is really signifying that the disciples are going back to their old ways. I don't know if you ever thought about that. That this is almost like the disciples have gone full circle. That Jesus had called them into this authentic relationship. That had called them into these new ways of being. Into this new profession. And for a time, while Jesus was alive and well and doing all these things in their midst. That it was real easy to follow. And they began to do these new things. And lives were transformed. Theirs being the first that were transformed. Other lives being transformed. And then somewhere along the way, now, after Jesus is dead, Jesus has already appeared to them. So they know of the resurrection power. Because John tells us this is the third time. The third time that Jesus appeared to them. So they know. They know the power of the resurrection. They know who they're dealing with. Yet. Isn't it interesting. That once Jesus isn't around every day and all the time. And things aren't happening the way they'd always been. That they had this propensity to go back to their old ways. To go back to their old profession. To go back to what they knew even though that's not what they were called to do. Does it surprise you then that they didn't have any luck catching fish going back to their old ways? I'm reminded when I read this that, you know, what Christ does not ordain, God will not bless. I don't know if you've thought about that, but when, but when we're going off in our own direction, we're going back to our old ways, it's quite foolish of us to think that God's going to somehow bless that. And we may have some good results for a while, but, but Christ, we know this from the whole series. Those of you guys have been sticking with us for all these weeks. Christ has called us to something bigger than anything we do on a daily basis. And that something bigger is to be a part of the kingdom work that God is about to bring others into authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. God doesn't want us to go back to our old ways. Now, let me tell you why I believe that God really wants to do this. Because God does bless those things when we're about what God is doing. Let me give you an example. During this sermon series, I don't know if you're aware of this, but during the month of July and in the last a couple of weeks of August, we have had the largest worship attendance in the history of our God United Methodist Church in the summer months of 2012. That our average of worship attendance over the last couple weeks has been higher than last year's average attendance. That the last several weeks, each Monday when I come into the office, what I'll get is I'll get a whole stack of cards that have been filled out from the first time guests of the church. And I have had no fewer than seven or eight cards every week, first time families to the church. Young couples, old couples, singles, with kids, without kids, people of all persuasions. Nine, seven or eight times where people would put first time guests to the church. And here's what's the beautiful part of it. It'll say invited by and they'll check that box and there'll be a name of one of you in the line. Invited by friend, invited by neighbor. I've been writing seven or eight of these letters Every week, all summer, since I came back from vacation. Now, what that tells me is this. Is that some of you, many of you, over the course of this series, you have heard God speaking to you through the stories. And God's inviting you to invite others into authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. And so some of you have taken it literally and ran with it and invited friends to church, invited them to the swim parties, invited them to the fish fries, invited them into the conversation, whatever it was, many of you have done that. Let me tell you something that happened this week, and it was powerful. And it reminded me how powerful this is. This whole idea of discipleship and our understanding that we are called to invite others into relationship. I, as I tell you, write these letters every week. And so I wrote a letter to a family. It was their first time to visit the church last week. And in the letter I wrote, uh, Dear so-and-so, I am so glad that you accepted so-and-so's invitation to visit our church on Sunday. My prayer is that you found our congregation to be warm and inviting and that you felt the presence of God in a mighty way. If you have any questions about the ministries of our church, please don't hesitate to call me. 
Many blessings, Pastor Corey. And I put one of my cards in there. Two days after I sent the letter out, I got an email from a person. And the person said, hey, we are so glad. This is how it started. We are so glad that we accepted, and they gave the name of the person's invitation to visit the church this last week. We very much experienced the love of Christ. Your congregation was warm and inviting. Uh, in fact, our intention, we're new to the area, was to visit several churches and make a decision about where we would land. We have decided that Argyle United Methodist Church is where God wants us to be. We very much felt the presence of God in a mighty way. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. I thought, wow. I show up at the swim party in Denton. And a woman and, and some kids come up to me. And this woman says, hey, I'm so-and-so. I sent you an email this morning. And I said, oh my gosh, yes, I thank you so much. She said, Pastor Corey, I'm telling you, this place is amazing. What, what God is doing at this church, we are so thankful that God has brought us to this community and God has already introduced us to this ch church. And what God is doing here, we can already see is just amazing. Um, she said, we're going to be out of town for the next couple of weeks, but I promise you, we will be back. Guys, that's what it's all about. That, that's all Christ asked us to do. Christ just asked us to, to invite. Christ just asked us to introduce. Here's the deal, guys. My job's pretty easy. You all have the hard part. You all invite all your friends to church, and I just make sure the sermons don't scare them away. How's that? Right? Um, our job's easy. You know, we'll just make sure the songs are songs that they can sing and, and, and experience the Holy Spirit when they sing. Uh, our jobs, friends, is to invite others into the story. And I'm here to tell you, if, if God will do that during a summer sermon series, and we'll have the largest attendance, in some cases, of the rest of the year, in the summer... Could you imagine what God is going to do in the spring and the winter in between Christmas and Easter this year as you all continue to invite others into relationship with Jesus Christ and to invite them into the story of what God is doing in this place? Here's what I want to encourage you not to do. Don't fall back into your old ways. Don't go back to not doing. Don't go back to... Uh, just doing your old things because you think, you know what? Oh, I invited a couple people and, and they didn't come. Some of you may think, well, I wonder if it's the one I invited. I wonder if it worked. Uh, some of you, do you guys remember what Mike said in the video? He said that he was after the same fish for three hours. Some of you, some of you will have a relationship with some friends or some neighbors and you will invite them literally for years. And they'll say no, and they'll say no, or they'll say yes, but they won't come. You guys know what I'm talking about? You have people in your life that you have a relationship with, and you've been trying to positively influence them for Christ for years, and it isn't working. I want to encourage you here today. Keep doing it. Don't go back to the old ways. Don't throw your hands up and say, you know what, it'll never work. Keep inviting them. Now, I want you to be careful. You don't become annoying. When somebody says, you know what, hey, pastor, I've had this happen. I was in somebody's home. I'd been visiting for a while. I've been a part of their life for a while. And the pastor, the, the man in the house said, hey, I appreciate what you're trying to do. I just want to let you know it won't work. Thank you for coming to visit us, but it isn't going to happen. Okay, I got it. And I left and I moved on to another family. Little did I know there were other families influencing this family along the way. And I looked up one Sunday and saw them sitting there with their friends. I was never going to reach them. This particular person was hung up on the fact that I was the pastor and I was only there because I was paid to be there. But when someone else who wasn't paid to be there came, his heart was open. I want to encourage you. 
as we consider this final tale, to consider who God might be leading you to introduce to Jesus and to invite into the story of what God is doing in our midst. Don't be surprised when you look up one day and the person you've been in relationship with for years, the person you thought was just turned in another direction, the person you thought wanted nothing to do with what God was doing, don't be surprised to look up one Sunday and see them with another one of your friends and to know that you perhaps had planted the first seeds that God had come in and began to nurture. I want to encourage you to continue to invite. I'll write 50 notes a week if that's what it comes to. You can't break me. Well, maybe you can break me. But I will write them as long as you keep inviting them. And I promise you this, as long as you keep inviting them, more importantly than a pastor writing them, as I promise you this, you keep inviting them, Jesus will keep transforming them. And along the way, Jesus might just transform you too. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the last breakfast. Thank you for coming back one more time to appear to your disciples before you entered into the kingdom triumphantly and finally. And as we eagerly anticipate your return, I pray that we'd be about your work. That we wouldn't fall back into old ways, maybe to go back to our easy ways of living. Because some of us feel like it's easier not to invite, then we're not rejected or turned down. But friends, it's not about us. People aren't rejecting us. Our responsibility as your followers is to continue to lead by example and to continue to be invitational in our approach. We'll leave the results up to you. So Lord, we thank you for these fish tales, for these stories, these miraculous, amazing narratives that, that are just so hard to believe because such amazing things happened and yet I think the real miracle of every one of these stories is the ways in which you used ordinary people to do an amazing work. It's bigger than catching fish. And it's bigger than building and new construction. It's bigger than ministries. It's, it's kingdom work. And every time a new soul comes into your kingdom, all heaven and earth rejoice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.